Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Museum of the African Diaspora. My name is Elizabeth Gessel, and I'm the Director of Public Programs in, here in San Francisco. MOAD is a contemporary art museum, and our exhibitions and programming inspire learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter in recognizing and condemning white supremacy and the ongoing systemic violence against Black people. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Andre Hill, Dante Wright, and Micaiah Bryant. We grieve for so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of state-sanctioned violence, including those whose names we do not know. We want to acknowledge that Moad's commitment to racial justice is ongoing, and as such, we will continue to say their names and hold space and honor these victims. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose land we are located. With deep respect, Moad acknowledges that even in virtual space, we reside on unceded native lands and thank the Ramatish and Chochenyo Ohlone peoples of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. I welcome you tonight to the program series, African Diaspora Film Club, occurring monthly with Cornelius Moore, who is the co-director of California Newsreel, the 53-year-old social issue nonprofit film distribution and production company. He is also an independent film curator specializing in works from and about the Black world. I also wanna thank Black Public Media for co-sponsoring the series and to POV, PBS's award-winning nonfiction film series for collaborating on the program with us, as well as acknowledge that funding has been provided by the California Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Today, we will discuss the documentary, Pure Kids. If you haven't seen the film, the link we have provided will be live through tomorrow, and I'll put that link in the chat as well. We are thrilled to have joining us for the discussion, Director Elegance Bratton and producer Chester Algernon Gordon. Elegance Bratton began making films as a US Marine after a decade spent homeless. Today, he holds a BS from Columbia University and MFA from NYU Tisch Graduate Film School. Walk For Me, his debut narrative short is about Hannah, a young trans girl whose secret life is discovered by her mother at a gay ball. His documentary feature, Peer Kids, is the winner of Best Poster for Indie Memphis, Best Documentary Feature for AGLIFF 2020, Emerging Talent for Outfest 2019 Documentary Feature. The film is also nominated for the Truer Than Fiction Independent Spirit Award 2021. He's the executive producer creator of Viceland's GLAAD nominated and Cannes MIPCOM winning series, My House. The Inspection, his forthcoming feature narrative script is supported by Tribeca All Access and Film Independent Fast Track and Producing Labs. The film is being produced by A24 and Game Changer. He is one of IndieWire's 25 LGBT faces to watch and the winner of the Mayor Biggers Artist Fund grant. Buck, his most recent short had its world premiere at Sundance Film Festival 2020. And Chester Algernon Gordon has produced a fleet of acclaimed short films and Spirit Award nominated feature documentary, Peer Kids. Gordon is a film independent 2019 producing lab and fast track lab fellow. Gordon's films have been an official selection at over 200 festivals combined, including Sundance, BFI True False, Doc NYC, New Orleans, Cleveland, Palm Springs, Black Star, and the American Black Film Festival. They're also a producer for the MIPCOM 2018 winner, GLAAD nominated documentary TV series, My House on Viceland. Gordon's latest short, Ship a Visual Poem, won best US narrative short at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. They're currently producing The Inspection with Effie Brown and Game Changer Films and Hellfighter, the James Reese Europe story with 555 Productions. Both films are directed by Elegance Bratton. So these are amazing um, filmmakers and producers with lots of awards um, on their shelves. And uh, we'll start the, direct, the discussion today with Cornelius, Elegance, and Chester. And we encourage everyone to participate by making comments and sharing reactions in the chat. 
and submitting questions through the Q&A box. And finally, please take a moment to type where you're joining us from in the chat, because we love finding the diaspora in our audience. And now I will let you, Cornelius, uh, Elegance and Chester, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great Thank answer. you, Elizabeth. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. And welcome, Chester and Elegance. And y'all are busy working, or working hard, quite as working men and uh, filmmaking right now. So, um, Thank you um, also for making Peer Kids, which is very moving and um, very deserving of all the accolades it's been, it's been receiving. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I want to acknowledge and appreciate that you began the film by, by uh, recognizing the, the role, the leadership role of um, Black queer um, folk, poor folk, you know, in the whole Stonewall Rebellion, which sometimes is forgotten, you know, mm -hmm. in the whole uh, so gay rights scene and gay rights movement. Um, so that's, I think that's important. So thank you for doing that. Um, thank you. For sure. My pleasure. Sure. So this is um, a several year journey for you with this film. So I'm very curious about how you started it, how you met, um, Crystal and Deshaun and Casper and the other folk who were involved in, who were um, subjects of the film. Sure. Uh, I guess the first thing I can say is that I don't call the people in my films uh, subjects. Okay. I, call them, I call them participants because okay. without their willing participation, there would be no film. And their, their guidance is what helped me to make this film happen. Mm -hmm. So you know, we, we did it together. So I like to kind of challenge that idea of what documentaries think of uh, the stars of these films. These are participants, they are filmmakers as much as anybody else involved in the process, even if they don't necessarily have the language to express their contribution. Um, that being said, mm -hmm. I, came, I came to Pure Kids through a, of a happy accident. I was mm -hmm. kicked out of my house when I was 16 from New Jersey, right outside of New York City. And I grew up, um, going to New York when I was broke because you could just go walk around and go to museums and look at buildings and that kind of thing. So when I got kicked out, I took a train and I went to New York and I saw these three black gay men on the train and, I, and they were really having a good time. And to be honest with you, I didn't ask them their sexuality. I just assumed their sexuality because they were being so flamboyant out loud. Mm. I didn't even know you could be that gay in public and not get in trouble. So as most of all though, they seemed happy and I followed them and they led me to Christopher Street Pier, which is, as you've mentioned in your, in your intro, is a historical site for black queer people to go and find themselves. So I started to find myself. I felt immediately understood. And over the next 10 years, I was homeless and I would always find myself back on the pier. And eventually I joined the military. And when I finished mm -hmm. the military, I went to Columbia. And it was when I got to Columbia and I saw these young people leaving to go back home at the end of their first semester, it made me question very deeply what that was for me. Where is that place where I'm, my return is eagerly anticipated? And I looked up and I was asking myself that question on the pier. And I looked around and I saw these black queer people for whom this space served a very similar purpose in their process growing up. Mm -hmm. So I went out, I bought the camera I used as a combat filmmaker in the Marines. I bought a computer and I began making peer kids. Ultimately, the film comes out of a desire to express that home is the place where one is most deeply understood. And also an intention to, you know, when I went to Columbia, you know, my whole life, I grew up needing money and being focused on getting money. And when I went to Columbia, you know, these kids had capital. They didn't necessarily need money. They had influence and legacies. And I had to ask myself, you know, what is, what is that for me? What is my legacy? And I realized that my experience being black, being gay, being homeless, this is the thing that differentiates me from everybody in this space. Mm -hmm. And that this is a thing that I, I needed to not be ashamed of, but rather to look at as a source of power. So Peer Kids is very much built within the idea of like discovering that my capital was my life experience. Thank you for that. And for also um, talking about um, participant versus subject. That's important. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
question about what I, I asked you was how did you um, make folk comfortable with you? Mm. Because, mm. you know, some of the experience I think has been um, people have been using them, exploiting them. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, you didn't want to obviously repeat that kind of situation, but so how did you make, the, make them comfortable telling this, actually telling the story? Well, it's, it's kind of twofold because I started making this movie in the summer of 2011. Mm -hmm. So this is at the point where, you know, VH1 had Love and Hip Hop, Bravo had Real Housewives of Atlanta. So a lot of people assumed that I was working for Love and Hip Hop, that I was working for Mona Scott Young. Uh -huh. And the, it, 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 I can't say that they trusted me, but they believed that what I was looking for were people throwing drinks on each other, people fighting, people cursing each other out. So they'd be like, oh, the Love and Hip Hop man is here. And people would put on these kind of shows and you know eventually people realized that I wasn't interested in that and I think that was mm. kind of that of building trust to do what I wanted to do right like having to work through this new generation's obsession with recording themselves and social mm. media and being you know famous and viral right how to get through that to get through to the true lived experience the the, the human condition that was challenging but really, truly, Crystal is the one who gave me the kind of North Star on how to approach this film. Mm -hmm. I'd been on the pier for about two months filming just interview after interview after interview. And I come from a military background as a filmmaker. So that's a very didactic you know, process. You ask these five questions, you point the camera in this direction, you light it this way, and that's it. That's the character and you're done. And so I'd gone through this process with Crystal for about a month. And Crystal turns to me and she's like, listen, if you want to make this film about my life, you have to be my friend. The camera has to be my friend. I'm a black trans woman. I'm homeless. I'm new to New York at that time. And I need people I can depend on. If I'm hungry, I need you to feed me. If I'm arrested, I need you to bail me out. Mm. I need you to be on my side and to believe what I'm telling you. And if you keep asking me questions as if you're studying me, then it makes me feel like you don't believe me and I can't trust you and you're not a friend. And when she said that, it was like a light bulb went off in my head because I had been, I'm not exactly in her experience because I'm not mm -hmm. a trans woman, but mm -hmm. I've been homeless on the pier before. And I understood in that, in that moment, like, oh, this is what this movie is. This movie is about putting the audience in the skin of oppression. This movie is about making it, making the audience experience the pier the way that I experience the pier, the way that Crystal experiences the pier. You don't, really know where you're going to lay your head at night but you know that you need a community to get through the night and that is that intention meant that going forward when i met people when i interviewed people that i was had to build the trust because i was building a friendship i wasn't just going in to extract the story that i wanted to tell mm -hmm. i was building lifelong relationships that kept me um, responsible for you know the impact of telling the story well, thank you, that's, thank you very much for sharing that because that's so important. And also for using your military experience for, well, for good. Um, <laughs> and that's important too. Um, so, and, and also talking about your responsibility to folks. I think that's also um, important. So can you say more about that, about your, your feeling of responsibility to the participant? Yeah, I feel like at the end of the day, I have been offered a transformational opportunity through the graciousness of folks like Crystal, Crystal Casper, and Deshaun. Mm -hmm. um, and I come from where Crystal Casper and Deshaun come from. So it's really important to me that this film is a platform for others to lift themselves up out of homelessness. And, mm -hmm. you know, immediate sense, I promised to, once the film becomes profitable, my participants receive 5% of those profits. profits um, so that's one thing I'm doing differently is making sure that they get paid from the film. And another thing I'm doing differently is we're, we're starting a nonprofit, um, a foundation where our goal is to use this project as a, a tipping point, a touchstone to be able to educate other homeless queer youth into the art of filmmaking so that maybe they can, you know, and some of them might have the opportunity to be able to do what I do. But at the very minimum, what I'm looking to do is to help them 
express themselves in the clearest fashion possible so that they can get into college and they can, you know, I wish when I was that age, I knew that all I had to do was write an essay about my life to get into a great school. And I, <clears throat> if I had known that I maybe would have spent less time on the streets. Mm -hmm. So for those who have that interest, I'd like to be a helping hand in, in getting them from where they are to where they belong. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we can repeat this later, but tell us more about that, uh, the nonprofit and, and cause I think people in the audience would like to know more about that and, and how they might be uh, in touch with it and support what you're doing. Well, we're, it will be called the Peer Kids Foundation. We're in the process of putting our paperwork together, getting the 501c3, which takes some time. But if you follow me at Elegance Bradman on Instagram, or Chester at Al Journal on Instagram. Probably you already follow Chester because nobody follows me. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. if, if you find us on Instagram, you'll be able to keep an eye on what we're up to. And um, yeah, that, and of course, keep up with the film because we'll be announcing these things uh, through our website as well. So y'all have a, a, a production company as well? Yes. Do you want to talk about it? Yes, our production company is called Freedom Principle. We formed it. Uh, about uh, a year ago. Um, Pure Kids is a part of Freedom Principle. Hellfighter is a part of Freedom Principle is one of the movies that we're producing under that banner. Um, and the inspection. And the, yeah, and uh, the inspection as well with A24 and Game Changer. Yeah, and Freedom Principle is a way for us to more, very much be more in ownership of the things that we make but also to create an opportunity and a platform for other filmmakers to make things that reach global audiences. You know, I, I'm really concerned with making sure that we're queer, that we're black, that we, we do the, we show, display the works of women. You know, it's really mm -hmm. about creating an op, a, a, a hub for, you know, ultimately, after, while I was finishing Peer Kids and I was kind of taking my shorts around a festival circuit, I got introduced to Hollywood at a moment when, you know, Black Lives Matter and diversity and authenticity had become much more kind of buzzy uh, in the industry. And I realized very quickly that a lot of the folks who are tasked with fixing the sorry history of this business as it relates to, you know, people of color and queer people are the very same folks who were discriminating against people of color and, you know, queer people, right? That we, although the industry ethos has changed, the individuals charged with enforcing this new ethos for the most part have not. Mm -hmm. So I really felt like it was really important for me to have my own company so that I can have a bit more agency and a bit more um, uh, power really to be able to you know, be the change that I wanna see and to you know, make it easier for people like myself to be in the legitimate business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I would like to talk about, about that a little more with your, your current production, but back to Peer Kids, uh, you said that one of the reasons you made it was to, to let Black families um, see what happens to the kids they kick out and put out of, of their homes and, and perhaps that have an impact and change people's ideas. Um, I'd like to hear more about that and its impact and, and what other goals did you have for the film? Um, you know, my main goal was to redirect the LGBTQ rights movement. Mm. You know, here we are 50 plus years after Stonewall. And, you know, when we think about Stonewall, what Stonewall to me represents, you know, we have people like Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, you know, these two trans women of color are homeless women, sex workers who in the summer of 1969, under ex intense police profiling, decided to say enough and I'm not, I don't deserve to be treated like a criminal for going out and living my life. Mm -hmm. And I think about that a lot. I think mm -hmm. about how these two homeless women of color, mind you, we've got Marsha P. Johnson is Sylvia's mother, her chosen mm -hmm. mother. Marsha met Sylvia at 17. Sylvia was 12, kicked out of her house for being trans. So right away, I think that this familial love is the thing, is the source of that bravery 
to be able to respond to such a, a well-oiled machine like the NYPD and say enough. Mm. Moreover, when you think about the legacy of Stonewall, right? There'd be no gays in the military. There'd be no gay marriage if it wasn't for a black trans homeless woman and a Latin X trans homeless woman who said enough. So in essence, the reason why the movie is called Peer Kids is because we are all the peer children of Sylvia and Marcia. Anybody who gets the privilege to live a queer life with relative certainty that you know, violence is not going to be exacted upon you, that you can work the job that you love, that you can marry the person that you wanna love. This is all because two homeless people with mm-hmm. nothing to lose and everything to gain put their lives on the line so that we could all live better. So to me, now that HIV and AIDS is a lifelong manageable illness, now that we have gay marriage, now that gays are in the military, what is the gay rights movement if people who are black and brown and of color are still eight times more likely to be homeless than their white counterparts? Mm -hmm. There are two million homeless youth in America. 60% of them are LGBTQ. 50% of them are black. Mm -hmm. So for 50 plus years, we have had a continuous epidemic of queer youth homelessness, even though our movement would never have happened if it wasn't for queer, for queer homeless youth deciding to say that this is enough. So in that regard, I feel that Peer Kids' intention is to say to the gay rights movement, there is no gay rights movement as long as our children are on the streets disproportionately to those who are not, who are white. There is no gay rights movement. This wasn't, Sylvia and Marcia did not take that risk just so that white men and white women could get married. They took it because they believed this was a way to change their lives for the better too. And I want peer kids to remind people of that. What about you? Why did you make the movie? What do you want to get out of it? Uh, I think I, I want people to use the film to navigate their homelessness like use it as a tool and um, also have parents watch it so they can stop kicking their kids out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So use it as a conversation starter because I know it's hard for a lot of black people to have conversations within their families and you know so much is kept secret and mm-hmm. brushed under the rug. Mm-hmm. Can you say more about how the, you've experienced the film being um, presented in that way? And with, with where you've seen that, that kind of dialogue happening? You know, it's tough in a COVID world. Um, mm-hmm. I, moments like this is when it becomes clear. I see, you know, people making comments in the chat and I'm assuming some of them are black people from the names, maybe I'm wrong. So that gives me a lot of hope that the mission is being met. At the same time though, we don't get to do in-person screenings yeah. we don't get to be <laughs> well, we don't get to go to the in-person screenings but yes we have a whole outreach program that's been happening or outreach plan that's been happening with pov we've been having screenings all the way in alaska and hawaii there's like curriculums that have been built around our movie that's been sent out to teachers churches to talk about this so yeah teachers can have conversations with their students about this type of stuff. And if they're going through anything that's similar to this at their homes, we've um, recently, we had like students in um, Savannah, Georgia, paint a mural based on our film. That's right now gonna be traveling throughout all of Georgia and not just Savannah. Um, We also have, uh, you know, all over the place, all over the United States, we have um, these screenings and these outreach things happening that's been planned, um, you know, to get these conversations sparked essentially. So I guess that's how we've, that's how we're able to witness it through these events and we hear about it, but a lot of them know we cannot attend because of the work that we're continuing to do. Mm -hmm. You're getting feedback from people, so. That's, yes. that's ev- evidence that it's having some impact. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm watching, I was looking at um, with Deshaun talking about how he was thinking about um, serial converting and HIV positive because there were resources for him for housing. And that was, 
that was astounding to me that he would have mm-hmm. to consider doing that. So, um, and, and so in, in your outreach and your materials, um, t- talk a little bit about what, what resources are currently available for, for homeless mm-hmm. queer youth. So, and so depending on what city you're in, so mm-hmm. if you're in New York City, um, We've partnered with a nonprofit organization such as uh, Ali Fournier, Ali Fournier um, the, the, door. the Door, and also uh, the LGBT Center, like the Gay Center, mm-hmm. that's um, in the West Village. Is it in the West Village? Yeah. Yes, in the West Village, yeah. yeah. Right. Always because it's by 14th Street. Exactly. But um, so we've had screenings there too with people and uh, also had conversations with them and they're getting services like the kids who go to these screenings get services at the end of the screenings from Mm -hmm. the nonprofits themselves Mm -hmm. and also uh in alaska uh there's a there's a thing that happens every year where people spend the night outside to raise money for the homeless kids there so our film is being screened in conjunction with that event that happens every year too and other events that happen too around the country Mm -hmm. And also we mentor Crystal. So Mm -hmm. Crystal in our movie, um, she's a filmmaker and she makes films now too. Mm -hmm. And um, Crystal's also gonna be in the inspection as well. She has a cameo on the film. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we give back when we can, Mm -hmm. but with the understanding that the work that we're doing is like, you know, I mean, as filmmakers and as artists, the work that we create in the world is like, you know, literally, our souls being poured out into these mm-hmm. things. These are the things that, you know, we've gone through in, in, in our own ways and that, you know, we're able, like the best way I think for people to learn that are children and mm-hmm. that are kids that are young is not you talking to them or talking at them because a lot of information, you know, you can hear, you, you can have those conversations with them, but a lot of it's not retained. The best mm-hmm. way to see it is to see people who go through it themselves and see how they navigate it and see that somebody validated them and speaking their truth themselves without having white people talk about the situation for them and know that they could talk about it themselves amongst each other too. And believe it or not, but having those conversations amongst each other sometimes help you clear your head and get your, get your you know, help you start to crawl out of what you're in. Yeah, you know? mm-hmm. yeah. And, I, and I, I mean, not to overstate my own importance, but I think the fact that someone who's who's black and gay, who's been homeless, who's been living like the people on the on on screen, has made a movie about that experience. Excuse me. Proves that there is another side to this. That there is a way to improve one's life, even though you have incredible struggle. And um, I believe that that you know me making the film is a revolutionary act that I hope, like, you know, my favorite band is the Velvet Underground. And they had this first album, it's it's called the Banana Record. And, you know, that album only sold 4,000 copies. But the rumor is that everybody who bought that album started a band. Mm -hmm. And much of what we love about, you know, glam rock in the 70s and punk rock and, you know, 80s new wave comes from that album. So I'm hoping that Peer Kids has a similar impact in my community in that if I can do it, you can do it. That, you know, there's a lot of kind of language of like, it gets better tossed around the queer community. But I think for black queer people, how does it get better when you have to contend with both homophobia and racism, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Peer Kids is a testament to how that can happen. But by the way, we reached out to organizations in the Bay Area, like um, Lyric, which is a youth organization, and TGI Justice, which is um, specifically works with uh, trans folks um, and led by um, Black trans women. So mm. that uh, I'm sure that the the work is is valuable and, and utilitarian to them too. Uh, the, I don't want to f- focus on this so much, but I mean, you did present how the how the folks are criminalized and mm-hmm. the, the role of the police in continuing mm-hmm. to harass um, mm-hmm. people and so I was curious also with did, did you have any experience while 
y'all were making the film. Oh yeah, I mean, it's funny because, um, I, I mean, I had a criminalization on both ends of the spectrum. This is, Christopher Street is one of the most kind of sought after red light districts in the world. I, I can't really think of maybe a hand, I can think of maybe a handful of places where you could r predictably, reasonably expect to go out af after dark and find someone who's black and queer to have sex with for money. You mm -hmm. know, I, where else in the world can this happen? I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, right off the bat, you're in a criminalized situation because, you know, after 9-11, New York City passed rules where it was illegal for more than two people to gather on any street corner at any time. And every black person knows the joke of like, well, if there's more than two black people in any place in public, here come the police, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. But then on the flip side of it, there's the client base. So when I'm in this space, I remember, I'll never forget, I had one night and I was very much a, a one man band making this movie. I'd have a little shoulder rig where I put my little SLR camera with handles. I'd have my sound coming out of my backpack. I'd have, you know, it was, it was like a, the little, the little toy that plays the drum. That, that's what I look like. Clearly I'm making up something, right? I'm not, it's hard to imagine I'd be a sex worker if I have this contraption on, but nonetheless, uh -huh. I'm out at the pizza shop and this white drunk man who was there looking for a date saw me and I guess he liked what he saw. And he literally put his hands in my pants, even though I was carrying probably about $15,000 of, of camera equipment mm. in that space. I'm criminalized by the client looking for satisfaction of their desire as much as I'm criminalized by the police officer mm -hmm. looking to meet a quota, as much as I'm criminalized by, you know, restaurants and other business establishments who don't want Black people there. Like, I, I, I kind of talk about it like, you know, a term I use is called temporal segregation, which I think is a, a, cool, a tool of gentrification which is, I think, ultimately a genocidal, you know, it's, this is this is a genocidal thing. This is about ethnic cleansing, right? Mm. And poral segregation to me means that after a certain hour, we do not want black people here. And the cops understand what that time is on Christopher Street. The businesses, the same pizza shop that I was filming at within two years of me filming, started putting gates around their tables at night so mm. that the black queer sex workers couldn't sit down and eat food for fear that it would, and mind you, this is the only place on the block where you could expect to get a meal for under 20 bucks, a full meal. Mm -hmm. So they're cutting people off from food. This is the same type of behavior that happened with the Boers in South Africa. It's the same mm -hmm. type of behavior that happened, you know, with um, the British and their colonial mis misdeeds. So, you know, when you're dealt with in the language of ethnic cleansing, when you're dealt with in the spirit of, of of temporal segregation, it creates, the police officer is not so much there to uphold the law as they're there as a mercenary of the state to cajole and contain the presence of black people. And when you are a young person who's already been rejected for being gay, for being trans, for being lesbian, for being bi, now you have to deal with all those complicated feelings and you're a kid, like you don't have the language to process all of that. Here comes the police to say, you are also a social pariah. Mm -hmm. You do not belong here. You do not deserve to be here. And as such, I can beat you. I can arrest you. I can do whatever I want to do to you. And I just find it so distasteful because these are children. Mm -hmm. What does that say about our society that we can see starving children and assume their pathology, but, uh, but never offer any sort of um, help? I find it to be somewhat despicable. Uh, temporal segregation, I, you know, thank you for that term. <laughs> it's gonna be useful and, and, and how you um, expounded on it. Cause I think it's, very, it's really important and right on to explaining right. the situation, you know, that, that a lot of folks face. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, I, I wanted to, to ask you about Crystal going home mm -hmm. to um, meet her aunt and my mother. And, and 
what that experience was like, how you got the, the um, her family, her, her aunt and her mother to be in the film. Um, mm. what, did, what did they think of what was going on? And, and now we're yeah. probably the question from the audience about that too. Sure. Um, yeah, it was, I had been filming with Crystal at that point for about a year and I gotten to meet her all of her gay children i mean crystal was always taking on gay children so you think you knew them all and then here comes four or five more from around the way and i just asked her i'm like crystal like why do you have all these kids like where does this come from come to find out that her aunt tammy had 10 kids and her mother had four kids and it, the more and more we talked about it the more i realized that she was using the example of the black women who raised her to guide the type of black woman that she was becoming and I just asked her, I was like, Crystal, how do you, has your mother seen you as a mm. full woman before? And she was like, no. And I'm like, how would you feel if I were to take you to Kansas City to see your mother this way? And she was ambivalent about it at first. She didn't really want to because it's traumatic for her to be in that mm -hmm. space. And she asked me, why did I think it was necessary? And the reason I made that decision is because I, this is a movie that I wish existed when I was 13 and 14 years old. I feel like the gay rights movement has mostly abandoned working class people of color. And for all of the success that it's achieved, like mm -hmm. reform, gay marriage, it's in the military, HIV and AIDS, a lot of that success was built out of this kind of Jane Goodall strategy of trying to prove that queer people were just like straight people. We wanna get married, we wanna have kids, you wanna buy houses. And as such, it put a premium on whiteness, right? Because the assumption being that middle America is mostly white and it would be easier for middle America to accept the idea of queer equality if there was a white face to it. So that means that people like me get left behind. So, you know, I really feel like Crystal and her mom are having a conversation that I never really got the chance to have with my family because the movement let my family down. It didn't care if my family had Trans 101. It didn't care if my family understood that although I am gay, I'm still Black. I still am a part of all of that. I'm not somehow transmuting myself into some sort of realm of, of, white, of, of white privilege through proximity. You know, the movement, did not account for the nuance that was required for me not to be homeless. Mm -hmm. So I felt, I, I, I said to Crystal, you know, for better or for worse, you being in this film makes you into a role model. And as a role model, I think we all have a responsibility in this production to show people how to have this conversation so that less people go through what her and I have been through. And once we got there, you just start to, I, I went to a place of empathy because no one ever set Crystal's mother down and thought she was important enough to explain to her how to accept her trans child. So how could I be furious at her for getting it wrong when no one has ever taken the time to help her get it right? To help her get it right. Including mm -hmm. her because of the... The people she had to look up to didn't necessarily teach her you know so many of us so many of our parents like you know i was born in 92 and my mom didn't have a an amazing example of a mom to like you know base things off like claire huxtable was her example mm -hmm. and it's like claire huxtable can only teach you so much because she doesn't teach you how to really deal with the hard things that your children go through right on that show you know yeah so i mean so and there's so, so many class things in that in that example exactly. yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah it's a different class than most people live in the united states period right, mm -hmm. right. and and it and it's one of those things where i i think sometimes that it is pot like the gay rights movement makes it seem like you come out and that's an end all and be all and if people mm -hmm. don't accept you then you can just discard them and run into the rainbow and find your tribe and to some degree that is true, but for people of color who are already under assault by the system, we need everybody to be on the same page, right? It's not gonna work for us 
it, it, it didn't work for me. I came out of the closet and I was homeless. You know, mm-hmm. I went to the gay pride parade and I was still homeless. It didn't work for me. So I was like, okay, how do I use this film to fill a gap rather than be in my, my feelings about how sad and lonely it made me feel and how, un, how diminished it made me feel that this movement could not account for my humanity. Mm-hmm. I felt like here I am at Columbia University, here I am at Tisch, clearly it's my job. I'm the person who can do that. That's what I can contribute. Tony Morrison always said, if you wanna read, if the, the story you wanna read is not out there, go and write okay. your own story, mm-hmm. you know? And that's what Peer Kids is. So the, one of the questions was, or comments is, how do you start talking with black parents who believe their children deserve homelessness because of their queerness and 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 the also bring in sort of the religion religion mm-hmm. issue and we have that in that interchange with uh, crystal's mother and aunt yeah um what and, what happened afterwards i that? guess crystal's now closer to her mom she's visiting her mom like yeah having like she went to the wedding at yeah. in full and also i think that i think that one thing that i've learned in my short time here or my or long whatever you want to call it is in my lifetime is that you know you have to nudge instead of push people mm-hmm. and sometimes you get better results nudging than you do pushing mm-hmm. and i think another thing is crystal i believe that radical empathy is what black people in this in the diaspora need to practice as part of their emotional DNA. Crystal expresses such radical empathy that the love she holds for her mother and aunt gives her the patience to withstand their transphobia so that she can walk with them through to the other side of understanding her. She has a much closer relation with her mother now because she was willing to hear what she had to say Mm. rather than a movement that tells us, well, if they don't get you, who needs them? Go on to the next parade mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know we were also grateful for crystal brothers too i just saw that comment yeah. but crystal yeah. brothers have not always been that way they've come they've come around to accepting her a bit more but it wasn't always as easy as it seemed you know and i think again you know it took a lot of nudging for crystal and like her brother said that like you know no one was there for her no mm-hmm. no rest. Everybody was there for him when he was in prison except her mm-hmm. she was the one who was calling him and making sure that he was okay. And I think that like, when you're in prison and you realize that, you know, you are somewhat forgotten and for a crystal to feel like she's forgotten all the time, that's something that they bonded on. Being like, even though he's straight, he's still a crim- like, you know, in his family's eyes, he's somewhat of a criminal. So, you know, it doesn't, it's not, you know, no sin or whatever it is you want to consider sin is greater than other or anything, but you know, they see each other. Did you say that Crystal's mother went to her wedding? No, um, Crystal went, went to her, her mother's, mother's wedding. wedding. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. And um, now you did give us an update about Crystal that Crystal's very active is still a filmmaker in her own right. What about Deshaun? Deshaun just uh, finished up his commitment to the state. He's now a, a man on the street, no rec, uh, no more jail days to serve. Mm-hmm. His, his, his time has been paid. He's figuring it out, you know, this, but that's the other thing about this movie. Like when I was trying to make it, people would tell me like, oh, you need to put more voguing in this film. You need to, can we watch them get in drag? Which is offensive, but they asked that. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately I was told that, you know, I had a teacher at Tish who told me, you know, Doc, documentaries are for white liberals. Like documentaries like this are for white liberals. The first thing she said to me, and white liberals watch films like this so they can be proud of how not racist they are, how how progressive they are. And when I watch your movie, I feel bad. I feel like a bad white person because the people on the screen live like I what I would assume people like that live like. Maybe you should put your story in it because you went to an Ivy League school. That way you can make white people feel better about basically being un- unwilling or unable to 
create enough change in a society to even the playing field. And, you know, I was incensed when she said it and I reminded yes. her, you know, um, you know, I reminded her how much money I was paying for that school. And, you know, like, you don't, I pay you too much money for you to, to make me feel like I'm dejected, um, <laughs> you know, but that, that being said, you know, she wasn't the first person to say something like this to me. Like movies like Hoop Dreams, even films like that I love, like Paris is Burning, it seems as though white America, and particularly this kind of uh, cachet of indie film, right, that they're not really interested in hearing about Black pain unless it's sung and dance at them, unless it's, you know, you, like a movie like Hoop Dreams, where like we revel in these kids' ambition to join the NBA, and we actually entertain it as if it's reasonable yeah. that these boys would have to be the best basketball players in the world in order to have an average shot at the American dream. It's absurd, you know? Yeah. And Peer Kids, in that regard, is a film that I don't think this is necessarily a depressing film, but it's a real film. There are no happy, easy, buttoned up, happy endings for people who live like this. I had to join the military. I had to be willing to risk my life mm. and kill other people, potentially, who are just as oppressed as me, just so that I can get a chance to get into an mm. Ivy League school, then get a chance to get into an elite, you know what I'm saying? It, it's like it's like a needle in a haystack is what, mm. is what telling us success in this country can be for people who are poor. And in reality, we need to make the, the, the playing field a lot more attainable, a lot more accessible for everybody. So I hope that, you know, I want to tell people great updates about everyone. And there are many people in this film who've changed their lives and are doing great. But there are probably more people in this film who have died too young, mm. who are still struggling with homelessness to this day. And that's the challenge of the work. It is to say, like, now that you've lived in my skin, I challenge you to never go back to your comfort. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I've wanted to, um, we're, we're getting close to the end, so I definitely wanted to hear about how y'all came together to work together. Um, and on, on top of that, what you're working on now and let the audience know that you're, you're on location in Mississippi with your current project, Inspection. Yeah. yeah. Well, I met Chester because he was stalking me on a social media app. He wouldn't leave me alone. He was on Jack and I was like, please, please, please. And not, I'm kidding. I'm, kidding. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> hearing that. That's not, that doesn't sound like it's true, but okay. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, we met in the summer before I started Tish. Yeah, um, but we did really meet on a dating app. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and we just started working together. It yeah. was like, you know, I started, I was costume designing stuff and then I started producing. Yeah, I was at Tish and I was making Walk For Me, a movie where pretty much everybody in it is black and trans and mm. none of my fellow students really saw it for me. They were like, how are you going to be like, because I whole idea at Tish is like, you know, Tish is small, New York University, New York University, yeah, yeah. you know, you have like a small group of directors who will make it. So everybody's trying to figure out who that's going to be and how they can like latch themselves onto that person and and get some version of their dreams to come true mm -hmm. and people at first did not think that i was that person at all mm -hmm. because of the stories i was compelled to tell and you know i had also discovered this wonderful enriching love that i have for chester you know we're married and it just started to make sense you know like why am i bending over backwards for people who won't ever really understand me and really don't mm -hmm. see my potential when i have someone in my corner who actually believes in me and understands where I'm coming from and, and more importantly has their own interest in telling stories like this. Mm -hmm. So we started collaborating together and from Walk For Me to um, My House all the way through to Buck and now The Inspection, we've been working together ever since. Yeah, and The Inspection is a film that's loosely based off of Elegance's real life story about a homeless boy who joins the Marine Corps, played by Jeremy Pope, who learned how to be a real man to, or- he, he wants to win back his love, his mother's love, 
but then discovers that the things he thought made him weak were actually his superpowers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, his mom is played by uh, the iconic Gabrielle Union. Yeah. We've got Bokeem Woodbine in the movie. Wow. Um, Raul Castillo, who's literally owns Netflix at this point. Yeah. And that's um, it. Yeah. And many other shining stars. Yeah, that you'll hear about soon. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we'll, see a, we'll see a trailer soon, right? Uh, That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, congratulations on your partnership. And I noticed that there was another film project, the, the James Reese Europe story. Hellfire. Which Hellfire. Yet I, I'm excited because I never knew about him. But tell us briefly right. about who he is. Who was? Um, James Reese Europe is a pioneering um, jazz musician who brought Black music to France as a member of the 369th Regimental Band. He was a captain of, he was a captain in the, the infantry and a captain band leader for this music. Um, before that, he was the first black man to compose, to be the, the conductor at a show at Carnegie Hall. He created the first black musicians union and ultimately kind of was a part of the generation that laid down the bedrock of the entertainment mm -hmm. business that, that you know, every joke in every ghetto in America, or it's not even a joke, it's actually a sad truth. A lot of kids believe they have to be an entertainer or a basketball player. James Reese Europe is one of those people who laid the foundations to make that anecdote possible. Um, yeah, so we're exploring his life through the lens of W. Du Bois's notion of double consciousness, of, you know, two-ness within one being to understand how ragtime music, double consciousness, and, and militarism create this really dynamic and important figure, forgotten figure of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Tell us again how we can follow y'all, because people uh, want to know where they can see these films. Oh, right? yeah. guys all you can, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can follow us at, at, at Pure Kids on all social media websites, mm -hmm. and then you can find Elegance and I through the peer kids page on instagram we're tagged in their post yeah yeah for sure okay yeah elizabeth just put um, that in the chat thank you elizabeth thank you elizabeth is but, this something go ahead oh, sorry just wanted to say thank you yeah it's awesome to be here i'm excited to see the museum in person one day and i'm excited by your partnership so thank you for for, for presenting that and you know, giving us that image because we need it. So, <laughs> is, there, is there something more you wanted to say about the film or um, your, your work or anything? I just want to say thanks to everybody who showed up to listen to, to us talk and to be a part of this conversation. And thank you for watching the film. And um, yeah, I, I always appreciate the community that I form through the art that I make. And even though we're not in the room together, I just want to let you know, I feel y'all and I thank y'all. So finally, how long are you going to be in Mississippi? Uh, we leave Mississippi this weekend. We go finish the film in New York, in yeah. New Jersey. Yeah. Got a couple more days in beautiful Mississippi. Okay. And I hope the weather's cool for y'all. You don't have any storms or anything like that. that <laughs> disrupts the production. So. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you so Thanks much. So much. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Thank Good you. Night, Bye. Thank you, Elizabeth. Bye. Thank you. I do have a few uh, last things to say. If you want to take one more minute, if you don't mind, um, I do just want to thank both of you for being here tonight, um, for all of your brilliance um, and and thought provoking words. I think it has made all of us think uh, more richly about the film. So thank you. Um, and I wanna let everybody know that the African Diaspora Film Club will be taking December off, but will be will return in January, 2022. And we'll be featuring the film Unapologetic, a deep look at black millennial organizers in Chicago and the movement for black lives from the police murder of Rekia Boyd to the election of Mayor Lori Lightfoot. So look for that information about the program on our website soon. And um, if you don't know, Moad has reopened. So if you're local or if you're traveling to the Bay Area, please come and see us. We have stunning exhibitions on view. 
Um, we would love for you to take a few minutes to fill out an online survey about today's program. I put the link to it in the chat and um, it should also pop up in your browser when you close out of Zoom. Um, please consider supporting MOAD in any way that works for you. You can donate on our website or you can text a donation to 56512 and type the word at MOAD SF and follow the link to donate. And finally, uh, I wanna thank Black Public Media, POV, PBS, California Humanities and the National Endowment of the Humanities for supporting this program. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank Bye. you all again. Bye. Thank you, Chester. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night.